Okay, so um, dear participants of this um, um, series of talks, um, um, my name is Timur Dudabayev and um, I'm a professor of international relations at the University of Tsukuba, where I also uh, serve as a director of special program for Eurasian and Japanese studies. Uh, we would like to um, uh, acknowledge that we run this program in partnership and uh, with generous support from the uh, um, Japan Found for Nippon Foundation. Now, today's talk is part of um, you know, our series on uh, Central Eurasian and Japanese studies. And uh, you know, thematically, our series focus on um, uh, Japan and Eurasia. And in terms of the topic, we attempt to focus on the you know, silenced voices and deconstructing stereotypes. Uh, which exist in uh, you know social sciences and in uh, general in uh, public policy. So um, uh, today's talk um, uh, is on the uh, Japanese whaling and people behind it, uh, to be delivered by uh, um, uh, Dr. Shutaba Nadia, uh, and um, um, it's going to focus um, on, on uh, in particular on this uh, you know um, aspect of uh, you know silenced voices and you know the voices which are uh, traditionally ignored or are not paid due attention. Now, uh, uh, before going into the uh, details of Nadia's talk, I would like to um, uh, also announce that, you know, our third talk will be um, uh, by uh, Ms. Dilnozo Baidulaiva, who is going, uh, who is currently a PhD fellow at the Australian National University, and who will speak on uh, internationalization of education in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan in particular. Uh, the final talk of the spring's li lineup will be by Mariam uh, Bibilashvili uh, on her uh, forthcoming book from Palgrave titled um, Towards the Normal State, Georgian Foreign Policy Between Russia and the West. Now, for those who missed uh, our previous talks or want to uh, revisit uh, the, um, you know, the essence of them, I would like to invite you to visit our YouTube channel. Uh, where um, uh, all the talks are um, uploaded as soon as we um, complete the online session. Now, let me introduce uh, um, uh, Dr. Nazir Shutawa. Um, uh, Nazir is, uh, is currently wor uh, working for the Partnership for um, Public Service, uh, which is a think tank type of NGO based in Washington, DC, where she works on several uh, projects and perhaps you know, she will also uh, briefly introduce herself later on but she uh, focuses on the leadership in government as well as public opinion and the government. She successfully defended her uh, PhD thesis uh, with us in Scuba in 2019 uh, and developed um, her um, um, uh, you know, work into the, this magnificent, magnificent uh, book manuscript uh, to be published soon uh, from Rutledge. Uh, prior to Tsukuba, uh, she received her master's degree in foreign affairs from uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And uh, we are very happy to have Nazia back, um, this time in the capacity of analyst and the trainer. Uh, Nazia, welcome back to the program. Now I'd like to uh, switch the floor, uh, the, to give the, you know, the floor to the moderate, for the moderation to um, Nafisa, and then we'll, uh, we can um, go into the talk itself. Uh, sorry, uh, Nafisa, can you take it from there? Thank you very much, Professor, for the introduction. Uh, good morning and good evening, everybody who is listening to our lecture. Uh, my name is Nafisa Insibaiva. I serve as a researcher at the Nippon Foundation Central Asia Japan Human Resource Development Project, and I will be moderating today's session. First of all, let me introduce uh, you to the structure of today's event. Uh, first of all, Dr. Shutala will have about 40 minutes uh, to introduce uh, the findings of her upcoming book. And then I will open up the Q&A session. Um, let me remind you that this session has been recorded. So you can either uh, push uh, the raise your hand button on Zoom and ask your question yourself, or you can type your question into the chat box and I will read them out loud after the speaker is done. So Nadia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nafisa, and thank you, um, Professor Dadabayev. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all today, and uh, it feels a little bit no nostalgic. Uh, really happy to see some familiar names here and a lot of unfamiliar names. So I'll try to be very detailed in my explanations, but also very much welcome uh, questions um, after I present my topic. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, and let me share my screen and share the presentation. Mm -hmm. So 
So give me some kind of a sign that you can see it, if you can. So um, Nafisa, can you just let me know if you can all see the, uh, the slides right now? Uh, yes, we can see it now, yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, perfect. So um, as uh, Professor Dedebayev mentioned, the topic um, that I was working on while uh, I was a PhD candidate at the University of Tsukuba and um, uh, the basis of my dissertation and the upcoming book is Japanese whaling and the people behind it. Um, this is actually a picture that I have taken myself uh, while visiting um, a small village in Chiba Prefecture where whaling is conducted and it was a, an open um, event. So uh, visitors and all of you, if you have interest, can um, come visit and see how whales are being caught and uh, well, not caught because catching happens in the ocean, but then when they're brought to the shore and dissected, you can see this exact picture here. Uh, and then I'm going to jump right in into how all of the stories started for me. Uh, so I will start from research idea or rationale for this um, uh, research study. So first of all, um, I have come to understand uh, that the language around Jap uh, Japanese whaling is relatively expressive. So there's a lot of emotions involved and predominantly negative. And I first encountered it when I was um, kind of shopping around for a topic that would be worthwhile um, all of the time and effort. Uh, which is quite a lot during your PhD degree. I was originally interested in maritime security. Uh, and uh, I picked up an article from CNN uh, that talked about Japan defying the world um, and still continuing research whaling, uh, regardless of the International Court of Justice uh, ruling against it. Um, so I was very surprised. Uh, I previously did not have an image of Japan defying the world on the international arena. Japan's um, general image is that of a responsible world citizen, so-called. Call, so called. It uh, is very careful um, about its actions on the international arena. It positions itself as an environmentally friendly nation that cares about the environment a lot. So um, this raised a few red flags or questions for me. Um, and that's how I started digging uh, deeper and um, uh, started uh, looking into this issue a little bit further. So um, I have uh, predominantly kept seeing uh, negative um, uh, connotations, negative narratives in uh, media and then further uh, in academic articles. Um, at the same time, I could very uh, much see that there is no strong counter narrative. So you needed to be very uh, persistent to be able to see, but what does Japan think about it all? Um, and uh, what is the Japanese side of the story? So unless you were in specialized academic circles or unless you were into international negotiations on the international arena, so um, things that are happening usually behind closed doors, um, you would not be able to easily understand uh, why Japan does what it does and what is the rationale behind that. Uh, and I have to say that in the time that I was working on this topic, um, uh, while in Tsukuba and then further on, um, I did not see uh, significant changes in this uh, predominant neg predominantly negative narrative. Um, so still uh, up until this day, uh, what we see in the media on Japanese whaling is uh, always featuring uh, the same words of Japan being irrational, cruel, um, making no sense and um, all of that is just very puzzling. Um, and I have uh, the word Sea Spiracy uh, here. Um, that is a Netflix documentary that came out, uh, came out last year. And I just mentioned it here because it's one of the most recent examples of how, in fact, the popular narrative, popular cultural narrative have, has not changed in the past years. Um, uh, Japanese whaling is one of the strong topics uh, in this documentary and still the very same words, the very same narrative, the very same tropes uh, are used throughout um, this documentary with very similar frames uh, that are just traveling from one article from one video to another without uh, much of it being challenged. 
so another question that was puzzling me is what actors are there behind Japan? So when we say Japan defies the world, Japan continues to research whaling, what do we exactly mean by that? And who are the people, who are the actors? Um, so clearly um, on the international arena, uh, there are representatives of Japanese, of the Japanese government, for example, uh, but clearly these people are not the ones who are doing the actual whaling uh, in villages, for example, or they are also not the ones who are behind small businesses in Japan, but all of that is also behind closed doors, uh, kind of uh, not um, mentioned or not explained too much in either academic uh, works on this issue or popular media as well. Um, so the um, research rationale brought me to uh, two research goals. And uh, the first one is to show the issue of whaling from the viewpoint of the Japanese people behind it, giving them back the control over the narrative of their own experiences in the context of major fluctuations happening in the perception and practice of whaling in the past um, half a century. So uh, as I mentioned, it seemed like the narrative was con constructed from outside of the people who were actually the authors and the actors on the scene of Japanese whaling within the country. Um, and the voices of people who were the actual actors and who were the ones um, directly involved in the activities of whaling and uh, even consuming products of whaling uh, were not clearly understood, explained, or heard. Um, so um, for me, it was interesting to look into that and perhaps give them a platform uh, to also share their experiences and um, uh, feelings and opinions. Um, and then um, the experiences shared by those chosen individuals or the ones that I had gained access to um, and their activities as observed by me were interpreted, analyzed and put into context to form a holistic picture of Japanese whaling. So a rounded picture that would uh, perhaps take different sides of the story into consideration. So the research questions brought me to, uh, the research uh, goals brought me to two research questions. And the first one, what characterizes the emic side of Japanese whaling? Uh, and uh, the second one, how does the emic perspective on the Japanese whaling correlate with the attic perspective? And then um, I go into uh, explanations of what is exactly emic and attic further in the methodological part, but I will touch uh, on this a little bit here so we can move on in a productive way. Uh, so emic uh, and attic are two concepts that are that come from uh, the field of anthropology and they are very widely used in anthropology. Um, so the field of anthropology itself has gone a lot of modifications in the recent years. Uh, if before historically it meant uh, a person uh, from uh, a country with the developed field of anth anthropology uh, going and conducting field work somewhere on um, imagine some kind of island somewhere far away uh, with a completely different culture. Um, so emic side would be the perspectives of the people on that island. So that untouched culture that was not um, open to the world or that was not known or understood by the world. So it is the view from within the views of the people who are the authors and the actors of that culture that is being studied. And if we um, turn the question to uh, look more, uh, to reflect more of the instrumental part, um, we can rephrase it as what are the experiences of people who have engaged with the issue of Japanese whaling firsthand in different capacities and on different levels. So I wanted to again inquire, uh, talk directly to people who were authors, actors of the Japanese whaling culture um, and see what is it that they thought, felt and experienced uh, in the context of this issue. Um, and then I wanted to also see whether the outside perspective or the predominantly Western perspective, although it's not exclusively Western, um, how does the outside perspective correlate with what the Japanese people uh, think about it? Uh, so how ethic perspective, the outside perspective is similar or different. And of course, intuitively, we can imagine that the uh, outside perspective would be a little bit different, um, at least a little bit, but in this case, very much different from what the Japanese people experience themselves. But um, I wanted to know in which ways exactly are they different and what lies um, behind these differences. 
So uh, this brings us to the next part of my dissertation in my book. We, of course, needed to uh, look into, or I, of course, needed to look into uh, the uh, background of the issue or the history of the issue. And um, uh, although this is a very, very important part of this problem, and a lot of the participants of my study were uh, uh, evoking certain parts of history, uh, going to historic events in their explanations or referring to certain elements of the history of this issue um, in their uh, in how they talked about it and how they talked about their experiences. Um, uh, it's perhaps uh, more efficient to read it all because there are a lot of dates, a lot of, um, a lot of different details, but I'm going to speak about some of the most important elements of it. Um, and perhaps with the elements that refer to the modern uh, culture uh, and more modern times. So um, one very important part of how the issue of whaling was developing on the international arena is the rise of environmentalism in the 1970s uh, and the rise of the so-called concept of the super whale that I talk about in the findings in the fifth chapter of my book. So, um, what is uh, rise of environmentalism? So pre-1970s, uh, the issue of whaling was not so much of an issue. Um, so basically, there was uh, the various nations around the world were uh, harvesting whales, uh, and a lot of them were harvesting the whales for the oil uh, that would, uh, was used for production of energy. Um, and then uh, the more they uh, did that and the, um, uh, the further uh, they were going in their explorations of the oceans around the world, the more depleted the stocks of whales were becoming. And that brought about the environmentalism movement. human exploration of uh, the environment, in this case, uh, different species of whales. Uh, the species became, uh, so the direct cause and effect in this case was very visible. And that's why it was so easy to use the um, example of uh, whaling uh, to be a flagship uh, issue in the development of the environmental movement. Um, and that is how whales uh, became one of the very prominent symbols of um, the whole movement of environmentalism and in fact continues to be one. Um, so what is the super whale? Uh, I would say that uh, the, it sounds uh, like something superior, uh, but it's actually a bit counterintuitively. Uh, it denotes uh, an oversimplification uh, and um, somewhat of a, of a simplified image of what uh, species of cetaceans are. So it is basically uh, using uh, that shortcut um, to imagine all whales taken together. So uh, people sometimes say that whales are intelligent or whales are helping humans or whales are majestic. And all of these, um, sometimes they refer to certain species of whales or whales in uh, beautiful songs. Uh, so all of this is um, a combination of different features or different elements of different species of whales. So if we're talking about beautiful songs, it's the humpback whale, uh, or if we're talking about intelligence, although, although intelligence in animal species is a very loaded term and we still um, don't have um, a strong understanding of what is intelligence and how do you measure that in animals. Uh, there is, for example, a so-called intelligence test uh, that is a mirror test that is performed on dolphins and dolphins recognize themselves in the mirror. So they know that the reflection in the mirror is a reflection of, of themselves as opposed to other, most other species that either ignore the reflection or think that the reflection is a different animal. Uh, so some animal scientists uh, view this as, as strong evidence that dolphins are intelligent species. Uh, but other species of whales um, don't pass this test. And it's very difficult to even try this test because obviously um, different species of whales can be different to interact with. Uh, 
because of their size and migration patterns and all sorts of other reasons. So that is just one example to say that the super whale is this one uh, aggregate uh, image that uh, we have in popular culture that was promoted by popular culture and most of all by the environmentalism of the 70s and that keeps uh, moving on and, and it has survived up until our days. Um, so again, the important part here is the oversimplification um, of something that is a scientific issue uh, and that only marine scientists would probably have good answers to and would understand a lot better than the popular culture does and feeds to us. So uh, post 1970s, uh, we uh, developed uh, in, the, in the Western culture, we have developed a non whalen norm and this is still uh, a predominant norm. Uh, this is something that you're supposed to say. This is something that you're supposed to believe in without thinking too much into it or, or um, finding explanations for it. Um, so um, cetaceans, as I said, in the concept of super whale, I believe to possess superior qualities, have special relationship with humans, and therefore we need to preserve them. Uh, another important point in the historical development of this issue was the... Um, uh, International Whaling Commission's moratorium on commercial whaling. So this was a direct uh, response to over-harvesting of whales and the danger presented to certain species of whales. Uh, it went into effect in 1985, and when it did went, go into effect, um, it was... Uh, so, right, so basically we see a clear uh, line of division between uh, what before was uh, seen whaling industry as an industry, uh, seeing whales as a natural resource that needs to be properly managed. Uh, granted, it was not properly managed, and that is exactly what brought about the um, exploitation uh, of this resource and over depletion of it. Um, however, uh, we were not talking about conservation, conservation at that point, and it only uh, started um, after the 70s. Uh, and, um, so in terms of uh, the background of whaling specifically in Japan, um, we can, or in my book and in my dissertation, I divide uh, it into different parts. And one part is included in the background and the history part, whereas the other part um, is history as an argument. Um, and it is included in the findings chapter. Um, so when we see history as a linear process, uh, a lot of the participants of my research and a lot of the background research that I did brought me uh, to Jomon period. This is where uh, most people believe uh, when uh, most people believe whaling uh, started in Japan. Um, you um, can also see that um, uh, organized whaling was happening in places like Taiji um, in Wakayama prefecture. Uh, and that was as early as you can see, 1606. That's the earliest date um, that historical records go back to. Um, also, one of the places where whaling was historically a prominent activity is Wadawura in Chiba Prefecture. That is the picture that was on the title of my presentation, on the title page slide of my presentation, uh, that I had a chance to visit uh, another place where whaling uh, is, has been a historically important um, activity is Ayukawa. Unfortunately, uh, that was uh, severely damaged uh, in the earthquake in 2011. Um, so I didn't have a chance to go there uh, during my field work, but I did have a chance to speak to some people who were prominent actors uh, on that in that part of uh, Japan. And uh, on several occasions, I had a chance to meet them and talk to them. Uh, so what's important here, um, and something that's again oversee overlooked and um, uh, not often mentioned, is that uh, in Japan, it was a unique case where uh, people were whaling predominantly for food. So if um, other nations were whaling predominantly for oil um, and energy, uh, in Japan, this, uh, the products of whaling have uh, always been a prominent part of food culture. And um, uh, that is how it's still uh, seen these days. And there are a lot of recipes uh, that are, uh, with the help of different organizations and different uh, activists in Japan, are trying uh, who are trying to revive the food culture and trying to spread the word on the uh, different ways of using uh, products of uh, whaling. So uh, in terms of history as an argument, um, 
one of the one of the arguments that Japan was presenting uh, during negotiations is that uh, the history of whaling in Japan uh, dates so far back that uh, the country has the right to preserve this as an element of its culture. Um, however, in the recent years, um, Japan has departed from that um, from that argument. Um, for that is that Japan would like uh, and still strives to be um, a leader on the arena of reviving uh, this tradition or this industry uh, for those places where it has been indeed historic historical activity. But also, uh, it would like to help those countries who have not uh, had this industry developed historically to potentially look into developing it right now as one of the ways of strengthening its uh, food security and just um, um, introducing a, a new way of, uh, of feeding the population of uh, different countries. Um, so if you adhere to the history argument, then you would have to agree that only those nations who have historically been engaged in Wayland have the right to continue it. But Japan is now saying that, in fact, this is not that important. Yes, it's uh, interesting to preserve it and cultivate continuity as a value, um, as I mentioned in my uh, writing. Uh, definitely Japan uh, highlights the importance of history and culture, but at the same time it is saying that it's not an essential element for development of whaling into the future, and we should be looking at uh, this again um, as a viable resource, as a viable um, uh, answer to the issue of, uh, of food security that is becoming more and more prominent as we, uh, as we develop, as we go forward uh, uh, into the future. So I'm going to only briefly touch on the literature review. Um, interestingly, uh, in pre 20th century case studies, um, we see a lot of works that look uh, at the role of whaling in shaping communities. We can see that in Japan as well. So uh, for a very long time, people who were engaged in whaling were seen as the providers for the community, as uh, strong people. Um, who possessed uh, all sorts of positive qualities, uh, who were seen as heroes, uh, who were seen as uh, main breadwinners. Um, also, these works talk about how um, uh, Whalen contributed to the development, the development of uh, uh, shipbuilding, for example, so the development of uh, um, engineering, uh, and also all of the accounts are very epic and dramatic and chapters and books. It's uh, a little bit romanticized uh, and showing the emotional component of the issue with the stress of uh, how important it was for the people. So the stress is on the people versus whale. Uh, the main actor is the person who whales uh, and not the species and not the resource uh, that is being whaled and being harvested. Um, so uh, pre-70s, we see more neutral accounts. Um, so again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, whales are seen as a resource, um, serving, serving the needs of people. Um, uh, and then um, starting from the 70s, as we remember the rise of environmentalism and uh, suddenly we see uh, majestic creatures, more emotional accounts and uh, uh, very starting of a very strong pro or anti whaling uh, stances and start of turning of that issue into a, a very emotional and heated debate. Uh, and also we see a lot of anthropomorphic terms. So uh, this is common with other animals that are close to humans, domesticated animals, for example, but uh, whales are not domesticated. And yet we can see uh, a lot of words and phrases that are used uh, uh, for people and we, we use them for whales and that does not necessarily have a lot of ground for it. Uh, again, unless uh, we are marine scientists, uh, it's very difficult to understand some issues and difficult to reach whales to be able to study them. And this is on an ongoing uh, science. Uh, yet we can see in popular media, save in Willie, for example, we can see that they can be friends with people. Uh, which I would say is a, a very dangerous thing to believe, for example, uh, where they can, uh, we see that they're caring for their young, which is again common in nature and not very specific for whales, uh, but we underline and highlight this qualities of whales that we see as unique uh, and very close to how humans live their lives uh, in popular media, which is um, 
not necessarily uh, accurate from the scientific and marine science point of view. So um, whaling in Japan uh, product, uh, predominantly attracts criticism, which is what we started from. And uh, one of the strong points uh, of uh, criticism within the country, as well as outside of the country, is the now terminated Japanese research whaling. Uh, so Japan has stopped uh, this programs partially as a um, response to internal demands. So uh, people were growing internally frustrated about Japan conducting um, research whaling uh, outside of the uh, outside of Japanese waters, uh, and that attracted criticism, and they saw it as a barrier for them to develop um, internal uh, whaling within the country's waters. Uh, and also there was very strong criticism from the international community because those are international waters. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, people who were criticizing that were seeing um, it as a pretext for Japan to just whale and they did not think that it was in fact uh, scientific research. Um, so one of the popular questions that is asked in literature is why Japan whales. Um, and I argue in my findings that it is a, a premature question at best, if not an arrogant question, because I find that we still don't know what it is that we're looking at uh, and asking why Japan whales without understanding what is it uh, for Japanese people and what kind of experiences uh, Japanese people um, have when they whale um, is not a question that is uh, timely. Uh, so uh, going on into my conceptual methodological uh, framework, uh, of course, with a with a complex issue, and and if you want um, if you want validity of research uh, to be strong, uh, I used methodological triangulation. Uh, always a good idea when you're um, doing qualitative research. So I used um, phenomenological approach. Uh, this is something that's used um, quite a lot. Um, in the fields of education, psychology, in other different fields, but it was, I believe, uh, it still is the first time that that approach was used for the study of uh, whaling and Japanese whaling uh, specifically. Uh, so this approach characterized by being interpretive. Um, a lot of importance is uh, placed on suspending one's own biases, and uh, this is still debatable whether it's even possible to suspend your biases completely. Uh, but at least you should be aware of your biases um, and of the fact that you are, in fact, uh, an outsider. You are not uh, um, somebody who is um, an author of the culture that you are looking at. Um, and you should try to be uh, going into your research uh, as neutral as possible. And then when you go into the analysis, then you can kind of uh, compare and contrast uh, emic perspective and ethic outsider's perspective. Um, so that's what I believe I tried to do when I was um, engaged with my participants, when I was doing field work, um, I was trying to be, uh, to be open uh, and flexible. And I was trying to, of course, formulate my questions in a way that would be um, open-ended. So the participants would be able to um, share the, their honest uh, experiences and opinions without me leading them in any way. And I have to say that I believe that I have achieved a certain way of suspending my own biases because without any doubts, um, as somebody who grew up um, in a country that does not whale, uh, and uh, I've spent a lot of time in Europe as well. So um, I believe that before I started this research, if somebody would ask me, do you think it is okay to eat whale meat? I would most likely say no uh, without really being able to explain why. Um, and I think this is a great example of how most people that I interact with um, and I share details of my research, they say the exact same thing. Um, and uh, while doing this research, I think I came to um, understanding uh, the other side a lot better and uh, seeing it from their perspective a lot better. So I do believe that I, I adhered to phenomenological approach um, as much as it's possible for a researcher. So um, an important part of it is also lived experiences. So you uh, never uh, look into secondhand experiences, secondhand um, uh, emotions, feelings. So you don't ask uh, what somebody else thought about Japan or Japanese people doing or feeling. You go into the field and you ask the people who are the, um, the ones who are directly involved in it. 
Um, and then the point of it all is to describe a phenomenon, so Japanese whaling through the eyes of the participants. So we're not talking about the participants themselves, we're just using parts and pieces of their experiences to form a picture of um, Japanese whaling or whatever phenomenon it is that you're looking into. Uh, another part of my methodological framework was um, ethnographic approach. Uh, so some say that uh, ethnographic uh, approach in ethnography is um, an essential part of any anthropological study and that unless you do um, unless you do field work you you don't you don't do ethnography at all. Uh, so I did engage in um, field work which was um, uh, direct and prolonged contact with uh, my research environment. Um, so we can say that it lasted uh, about three years, but now really five, because I'm still keeping in touch with some of the uh, participants of my research. Uh, and uh, a part of um, the work on my manuscript included uh, updating some of uh, the interviews, some of the information that I received from um, my field work in Japan um, and um, doing a little bit more of that. So although the in intensive phase was over while I was doing my research uh, at the University of Tsukuba, uh, I would say that still on and off, it's, it's a little bit continuing into 2022 as well. Uh, so the group of interest was whaling Kankesha, how they sometimes call themselves. So people participate in, in Japanese whaling in one or uh, another capacity. Um, and then again, uh, I already talked about emic and etic perspectives. So from inside the group uh, and etic from outside of the group. So um, uh, both phenomenology and ethnography were used in combination, and this is quite a unique uh, combination to study different things, but specifically Japanese whaling has not been done before. Um, in course of this research, I conducted um, 46 um, in-depth interviews. Um, it was mm, uh, used snowballing technique to identify the next participants and the next participants. And uh, as it happens, um, sometimes it's it could be a little bit complicated and difficult in the beginning. Uh, so you have to identify the so-called gatekeepers, so people who can uh, open doors for you, people who can introduce you to other people. Um, this is uh, a technique that's very common in anthropological uh, research, uh, but I would say that uh, in the context of Japanese culture, this is even more important um, because uh, people find it more comfortable and easier to get introduced by somebody they already know. It was especially important in the specific case of Japanese whaling because um, as it was already a heated debate, uh, an issue that um, Japanese people were uh, strongly criticized for, uh, and they had already had they already have had interactions with uh, Western researchers uh, or journalists, uh, documentary filmmakers that were. Um, not exactly in their favor. Uh, so the result of that, although the Japanese people were always very eager to show their perspectives uh, and to open the doors of their villages to show how it actually is and try to explain themselves um, for a number of different reasons, it was not going uh, the way they wanted. And the, the image of Japanese will and Japanese people were engaged in it was always very, very negative. So um, I definitely have to mention that uh, when I first started my research, it wasn't easy to um, establish that connection and to establish trust between uh, me as a researcher and people who were um, related to Whalen in Japan. So that's why it was really important to get those introductions uh, and to keep showing up uh, at meetings uh, or so-called events, how I call them throughout, the, throughout my book. Uh, so... Um, Again, another part of field work is, of course, uh, participant observations, uh, observations, and here uh, you can see all the different types of events that I have participated in. So different promoting events, I went to fish markets, restaurants, um, uh, talked to different business owners, uh, events from the Ministry of uh, Forestry and Fisheries, uh, film screenings, um, I went directly to the villages where uh, Japanese people um, have been historically uh, whaling in, um, which I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, so all of these, um, I 
would say that um, at the point where I started being invited to these events, um, I had a feeling that I'm more or less an accepted member of this community in a way, although uh, people realize that I'm a researcher and I'm still trying to be neutral, but um, I definitely felt like people were comfortable and uh, eager to share their their opinions uh, with me. So from that point on, I think it became a lot easier. Uh, so in terms of the findings, um, uh, interestingly, I already talked about a lot of the parts um, of the findings throughout my presentation, uh, and that's um, to show that the whole dissertation, the whole book uh, kind of refers back to different parts of itself, uh, so it's all very interconnected. Uh, so uh, in the findings, I talk about the concept of super whale um, and how in the Western discourse, we don't necessarily ask the right question. So again, as I said, asking why is premature because we don't really understand what um, and what it is from the perspective of Japanese people. Um, again, um, the social landscape of Japanese whaling, uh, this part of uh, my chapter um, talks about the different uh, ministries that are involved in, uh, um, uh, in the issue uh, or in the practice of Japanese whaling on the ground and all of these organizations that are mentioned here. Um, so most of them are, um, I would say pro whaling, although uh, later on I'll go into the absence of actual pro whaling and it's more uh, anti anti whaling. Uh, and then Iruka and Kujira Network is the one uh, NGO that is anti whaling, and it basically is just uh, one um, lady who is very uh, strongly minded and she campaigns against Japan continuing whaling. She's also a vegetarian, so understandably, this is an important issue to her. Uh, but then, so basically, um, before I went into this research, I could not identify all the names that we can see here in the list of people and organizations who um, have a place in the network of um, those who participate in Japanese whaling. Um, and I think it's interesting to understand that it's not some abstract Japan, but it's actual people with their own life stories and their own motivations. So for example, for a lot of business owners, it was a business started by their uh, fathers, their grandfathers, or some of them are actually young people who are very um, adamant about making uh, it into a new and luxury experience. So dining uh, where um, the uh, main uh, part of your menu as a product of Wayland uh, should, in their opinion, be made into some kind of like a luxurious experience that is only available in Japan. Uh, so all of those conversations are outlined in the book, and it's quite interesting to to read. I believe I was definitely um, captivated by all of these stories. So um, another part of the findings is the um, pillars of Japanese whaling as identified by me. Uh, so again, interestingly, the first one I already talked about, um, the history argument and its downplaying. Um, and continuity. So when I went to WADA um, and when I went to Taiji, uh, you can definitely see that uh, the mayors of these towns and the people of these towns, um, they place a huge, huge importance on the history of Wayland. So everything that you will see around Taiji um, is in some one way or another um, related to the history of Wayland. So you would see statues uh, of whales and a Wayland museum. Um, and the owner of the, uh, the uh, uh, I don't know, the manager of the museum, I guess is the proper word, uh, was um, very eager to also talk to me and to tell the story. So they definitely cultivate continuity as the reason behind the need for them to continue this practice. Uh, but at the same time, we see the fact that Japan as a country would want to downplay the history argument to be able to also say, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a historic practice. So it has, it has the right to be, regardless of whether it's a strong part of your culture or not. Um, and an interesting finding and an interesting uh, theme in all the conversations that I've had with my participants is uh, something that's han han hoge. Uh, so uh, basically, I borrow the term from psychology uh, that's called reactivity. So uh, this is your uh, changing of your own behavior 
um, in reaction to somebody else's behavior. So interestingly, um, in um, all of the conversations that I've had in all of the events, uh, most people use Han Han Hoge. Uh, so this is anti anti Weyland instead of pro Weyland, because obviously the people in Japan were for the longest time taking the whole thing for granted. Uh, like if you imagine any other uh, consumer product, let's say cucumbers, you don't say I'm pro cucumbers, right? Because you know cucumbers are widely available, they're cheap. They nobody is saying anything against it, so you don't necessarily need to be pro cucumber. It's in the same vein. There's no pro Whalen. This is just a, a completely integrated part of their food culture and their cuisine. And the only reason why uh, Japan as a country started looking at it and reacting to it and reflecting on it is because there was such a huge anti Whalen movement coming from the outside. Um, so that anti Whalen movement actually is what started shaping the. Uh, the non pro whaling culture in Japan. And um, this is not only a conceptual, conceptual thing, this is not only about how people talk about it, but this is also, um, uh, it also had very real life consequences. So for example, the um, uh, whaling, uh, the part that was the part the part of the uh, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries um, that was um, uh, working on Wayland specifically, there were people there who, uh, whose work uh, from the moment they started working was to, uh, for example, make sure that uh, Japanese whaling ships are safe from uh, the uh, so-called environmental protection um, uh, ships. So while Japanese ships were attacked, uh, they had to employ another ship to protect themselves. They had to hire people who would be responding to it. They had to hire people who would make sure that the Japanese crew was safe in the face of uh, attacks of environmental protectors, so-called. Um, so real life consequences and um, reactivity um, in terms of how Japanese people define themselves. Inevitably, all of the conversations that I was having were on uh, what they are not. So they were always saying, oh, the West says that we are this and that, bad people, cruel people, but actually we're not. And then they would proceed to explain in what they are and what they think they are. Um, and then, yeah, this other pillar orientation towards the future on Japan, uh, trying to reinvent um, the history argument and be a leader in the international arena, and also trying to revive level, uh, uh, revive Wayland on the national level is another uh, strong element of uh, the whole discourse. Um, so with that, um, most of my presentation is over. Uh, and uh, Nafisa, if you could just remind me how much time I have, because I know that we skipped five minutes. So I also have a video uh, that I have prepared for our uh, participants, but um, I'm not sure I have time to show it. The video is around five minutes long. So let me know if we still have time for that. If not, I'll be happy to jump right into questions. I think the audience would be interested in uh, seeing the video because I know it was a very documentary style um, research that you conducted, visual research as well. So we mm -hmm. would be interested in seeing it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so this is not the video yet. This is the picture of a Japanese school lunch. So as I said, I participated in many um, so-called events and some of them were held in um, schools. And this is um, for those who don't know, it looks just like any other Japanese lunch, but the meat here is whale meat. Uh, very tasty, very good and uh, um, love participating in an event. It was very interesting to see in person how it's conducted and how the kids and most importantly, their parents react to it. And then right to the video. <laughs> ま、食べるっていう、ま、当時油を取ることがいろいろもっと違うと思っていたかもしれない。あるのは間違いないんだけど。それ食べるって形で400年続いてきてる仕事なんですよね。だからあの、僕はそれを大事に後に残すっていう
僕はここで、まあ、生きてる間にできる、まあ、人の仕事だと思うしそれに価値があると思うからね、うん、逆にほらあのみんな辞めるの辞めるっていうもんでさだから本当に辞めちまったら終わっちゃうんだよね一回辞めてしまったらまた悲観が多くてまた元に戻らないでしょ辞めてしまったら本当終わっちゃうと思うからだからその辞めないっていうことが一つのなんていうかなあのまあ絶対にしなきゃいけないことだと思って僕はやってるんで。なんやめなきゃいけないってなっちゃうかもしれないからそうならないようにすることに一つの自分なりの、まあ、生きがいというかそこまでやれば地域の皆さんが買ってくれて食べるっていうふうになるんだけどそういったその一つの循環ですかねそういったものをあのきちっとあの次の世代に残すっていうことが一緒なんていうかな僕,僕はたまたまこの世に生まれいてて。たまたまなんでかしら、一つの役割を演じるというとすれば、それはなかなか悪い仕事じゃないなっていう、そんな印象ありますね。だから、ただそれがその仕事の面白いところっていうか、っていう、だから、ちょっとやる気もあるっていうか。徹底的に取材が始まったの、関係者の。で、いろいろね、取材して回ってもね、いつまでたってもね、あの食べる人の話っていうか、消費者の話が出てこないのよ。それでね、なんだかちょっと変だなと思い始まって、そこからだね。そうですね。ね、それをやっぱりちゃんと伝えないと、国民運動じゃないとおかしいじゃないのと、これだけ劣勢になってしまっていることをね、戦うのにはっていうことから立ち上がってしまって。だからみんながたくさん昔のように食べたいんだっていう声が大きいから、日本政府は頑張るって形にしたかったわけ。でもなかなかそうはならなくてどう伝えたらみんなに伝わるのか国民にねあの関心持ってる人はどんどん減っていくわけですよ。で大方はもう関係ない食べたいと特に思わない当時はとても高かったから今よりよっぽど高かったからこういうことで一つの産業と文化を失われるのってやっぱり納得いかないっていう気持ちが強かったんでね見方をどうやって日本の中で作ろうかっていうことで新聞に書くだけじゃダメ。やっぱり体験もなくちゃっていうことで食べる機会と料理をみんなで作る機会をで小さいながらもそういうのをずっと続けてきましたね。がないからもう築地市場に行って専門の商社があったんですよ。今も潰れちゃったんだけど。でもそこで自分でお金で肉買っておきやってたのよ。で、人集めて、<笑>で、まあ、政府の人とかも来てもらってね、来れる時には、だからもっと必要ですよって言い続けて。ただそれがなかなか国の大きな動きにはならなかったんだけど、あの繰り返し繰り返し。でそれを小学校でもやるで小学校でやるっていうのがハードル高かったんですよだけど絶対小学校でやんなきゃダメだっても思ったわけっていうのは子どもに教えなきゃあのそれから先生に教えなきゃあそれと教えなきゃ国に変わらないからあの、うん、あの子どもだけじゃなくてね私ね若いお母様たちをねセットでね、お金持ってるのお母さんでしょで、まあ、小学生の子供っていうのは食べて美味しかったらお母さん買ってって言うじゃないだからお母さんもクジラのこと知らないからセットで学校に頼んで子供50人。From my personal perspective, it's really clear that, that there are whale stocks that are doing, doing well, in some cases doing really well, and they actually can sustain、um, a hunt. And really, the IWC agrees with that. You know, gray whales in the, the Eastern Pacific are obviously a hunt sustainable, and they have approved a hunt for Russia and the US.、Uh, bowheads are another example, again, be, shared between US and Russia, where the population is large enough and the hunts are clearly sustainable. And so that's the case for those two stocks. And there's others, Aboriginal hunts as well. But it's true for commercial as well. And I know that, that many people are really concerned that there would not be a way to monitor、um, commercial hunts. And that, you know, because it's commercial, people are going to try to get more than they're supposed to and that kind of a thing. And there may be ways to deal with it. But the science suggests that these hunts are, are sustainable. Having said that, though, scientists aren't the decision makers. Scientists aren't the ones that get to say, here's what needs to happen or what、uh, it should be that way. But,、um, but it's not. And so the politicians and the commissioners here have to balance what they get from science with what society tells them, and in particular, what their own countries tell them. And my personal feeling is I wish that the commission took more guidance from the scientific committee and listened to what we had to say about sustainability of hunts, 
or risk to to different populations from lots of different threats you know but they're doing what politicians do and they need to weigh what their constituents what their nation tells them is important for them all right so this is the end of the video um and i have um I have filmed a lot more uh, and there was an idea of uh, having a, a documentary made, uh, but then with COVID and, uh, and the idea developed into it being, um, uh, so I want to actually make something that would show the progression of the issue um, throughout uh, multiple years versus just a point in time. So uh, this, is, uh, this project is an ongoing or on pause uh, for now, uh, but uh, lots of interesting stories, themes, and materials that went into the book. And uh, there's a lot more that could be potentially made into additional articles. So with that, I am going to conclude my presentation. Thank you all for listening and happy to take questions for the time we have left. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, now I will collect the questions from the audience. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Dadabaev. Yeah, just um, just to kick it off, because you know I know that people might be a bit you know hesitant. You know, two things basically. You know, I'm you know as um, you know I. Um, yeah, you're with us, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, I'm you, but I missed the question completely. Unfortunately, you know, it, it's <laughs> it's not a question. It was just a reflection. You know, so it's okay. Yeah, but, but you know, I I really liked you know what what you presented. It's fantastic, absolutely. But you know the two questions that I had. So eventually, you know, going back to this big question. So what needs to be done to provide um, uh, this, uh, you know, the um, perspectives which are not there? You know, it's you know, even from this extract that you've just you know shown us, people are really struggling with this. You know, they they don't know how to convey this message. You know, so going through this, you know, I, I'm just wondering, you know, what is your conclusion about? You know, what is the uh, proper sort of uh, way to deliver? And the second, uh, you know, issue, it's, you know, it was also partly in this, you know, in this, uh, you know, video that you showed, you've actually attended the sessions in the, you know, International Whaling Commission. So I'm just wondering, you know, what was your impression of the role? Because, you know, as someone who's outside of this field, you know, I would expect that this is the commission, which is there to balance these views and provide some kind of, you know, balanced uh, decisions and etc. So, you know, as someone who was in this research, you know, I was just wondering, you know, what is your view on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any more questions in the chat or? Yes, we have one more raised hand, I believe. Okay, if I may ask uh, another question. Uh, which is uh, mostly in regards to how you conducted the research, because this research topic is very, it involves politics and science and culture, uh, identity. So I was wondering, apart from estab establishing trust with the people that you were interviewing, what was the um, major challenge in your research and how you tackled it? Thank you very much. questions uh, and then um, I will collect more if they arise. All right, uh, so great questions. Thank you, thank you for, for raising those. Um, so what should be done and the ways in which the message or the counter narrative should be presented. I actually believe that uh, people in Japan who are very prominent actors uh, on this area, in fact, one of them is here with us, Georgi Morishita Sensei. Thank you so much for attending today's lecture. Uh, somebody who was my unofficial mentor throughout this research. So I'm going to use this opportunity to thank you one more time for everything that you've done uh, throughout this time. Uh, I think that the fact that I was so supported by uh, Professor Marisha, a lot of other people, people in the ministry is because um, the people who are involved in Japanese whaling realize that uh, they are outnumbered. So clearly on the international arena, the narrative that is anti-whaling is so, so strong and predominant right now that uh, only by inserting the counter narrative in any way possible um, with time, and they still have the hope that it is going to happen with time, um, we could potentially balance it out or change the narrative to at least uh, a neutral opinion. Um, 
to be completely honest, I think that because it has not happened in so many years and all this throughout all these years, we kept getting the same kind of image, the same kind of narrative. And uh, because uh, unfortunately, as humans, we don't have time to look in depth into any question. Um, in a lot of cases, we just have this very surface understanding of everything. And when we are fed the same kind of image uh, for a very long time, uh, we tend to accept it as our norm. And norms uh, are challenged um, very rarely, or um, it's very difficult to challenge them. And um, again, I, I always use the example of actually myself um, to, to, to show that it took me quite some time to understand the Japanese position. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that I suddenly feel like the whole world should be eating whales, but uh, or whale products. Um, but I do feel that um, depending on the circumstances, depending on the, the uh, environmental situation, depending on the species we're talking about, depending on how it's done, um, it could be an acceptable solution to a lot of different problems. Uh, but it took me a lot of time to come to this conclusion, and it took me this whole research to firmly believe this. Um, so I would say that one way, one way to tackle that is to continue supporting people who are uh, making an earnest and uh, honest attempt to uh, find out, which is exactly what the Japanese community is doing. So every time somebody's trying to look into it, they are very open, they're ready to support you, they're ready to connect you to the right people. Although yes, it does take time to gain their trust, but once that's done, uh, they will do everything and anything to support you on your way to uncovering the truth for yourself, whatever the truth might be for you. Um, so continue doing that and also uh, present this uh, counter narrative in many different ways. So. Um, as we all know, coming from academic background, academic articles are not always accessible, not everybody reads them, and when that is countered by a very strong uh, popular cultural uh, narrative, so we see documentaries that are anti whale and we see short stories, we see social media pieces and photographs that are very drastic, that are very easily presented in very emotional negative ways, so if you see a huge uh, whale uh, and blood around it, you immediately have a certain image and it takes time to, to present something completely different. So I would say finding ways of presenting counter narrative in different forms. So not only lengthy academic articles, but also, and I'm not denying that that also has the right to be, uh, but also perhaps social media pieces. Um, my attempt at making a documentary was coming from that part as well, because obviously visual information um, has a different way of reaching uh, minds of those who are watching it. Um, and, you know, social media is something that's very prominent right now. So those are some of the ways that I see potentially bringing about change. Um, and in terms of what the Japanese people are doing is again, uh, engaging in this promotional events, going to schools. So starting to teach mothers uh, about how to actually cook whale meat, for example, because it's something that's starting to be forgotten um, and they're not as uh, familiar with this as they used to be. Uh, so. I would say lots of different ways um, and trying to approach the issue from lots of different uh, directions. It just, um, uh, sorry, just, just a small thing. You know, you mm -hmm. mentioned in, your, in, in the beginning of your talk that, you know, there is this culture in the West and perhaps not only in the West, you know, that there are certain things that we, you know, say because, you know, this is correct. And, you know, what, you know, you present is uh, now perceived uh, as to be not very correct, you know. So, by suggesting, well, I agree with you that you know we need to provide this you know in the most sort of accessible way. But again, I mean this then would be censored for being you know again biased and you know incorrect and you know. Absolutely. How do we deal with that? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> how do we present a completely different narrative that is countered by a strong popular uh, cultural movement? I mean, it's been going on since the 70s and it takes courage, first of all. So I'm not going to lie. When I was working on, on the manuscript and when I'm still now working on the documentary, always in the back of my mind, there's uh, thoughts on, uh, you know, how is it going to influence my career? What are people going to say? Is it going to be perceived? Are people going to actually think about it and look into it in detail? Or are they going to, you know, dismiss it and say, oh, no, this is horrible. What is she talking about from the very first phrase? Are they going to just see me as somebody who promotes whaling? 
or are they going to actually look into a layered narrative that I'm trying to present? And I don't have an answer for that. I'm sure that there are some people who are going to uh, perhaps dismiss me as somebody who is just uh, for some strange reason supporting people who eat whales and this is unacceptable, but I'm still hopeful that you know, some people and maybe not a huge portion of people, but some will look deeper into the problem. And, um, and I think that it's important because I think that for me, presenting various sides of the issue uh, makes sense. And as a scholar, I think that's what we are all here for. So I guess I'm, I'm betting for it and hoping that some people will be uh, more attentive and less superficial. So that's the first question. And then the second question on um, the International mm -hmm. Whaling Commission. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, thank you for the comment from Georgia Marista. Um, so uh, the second question on the International Whaling Commission. So the impression that I had and the fact that uh, uh, they're supposed to be presenting a biased, um, a non-biased uh, and more balanced uh, opinion. Um, I think that's actually an interesting question that goes beyond the specific issue of whaling. Um, I think we see that a lot in the recent years um, in terms of constructing uh, some kind of a narrative in the popular media um, and everybody just going with it and politicians respond in, well, basically populism. So politicians just go in with whatever they think is going to get them elected versus going with what is the right thing to do. Um, and I think because the International Women Commission is an international negotiation body and only a portion of the people who um, are present there are scientists, uh, the rest are country representatives who are, as uh, um, you saw my interviewee in the documentary say, who are mostly just representatives of the people who are on the ground, who are just you know, uh, the representatives of the cultures who find women unacceptable, cruel, who see that overly generalized picture of super whale, um, those are their con constituents and they have to represent their opinions uh, on the floor of uh, international negotiation um, uh, spaces. And uh, unfortunately, uh, International Whaling Commission is not an exception. Um, and they say that in the uh, recent years, it actually became better. Uh, so the one year when I had a chance to uh, participate in it uh, in Brazil, um, and it was in fact uh, before Japan left the organization, uh, to me, it looked uh, very heated, very illogical in a lot of cases, people still kind of just repeating what you can read in articles that just label it cruel and unacceptable. Uh, versus actually operating with scientific terms, scientific findings. Um, so it was very surprising to me. I mean, although I knew what it was going to be like, still seeing it in person and, and being there in person was uh, somewhat shocking. Um, but according to uh, my research participants, that was a huge improvement from say five, seven years before that, when they were just saying that it was just tons of journalists, people fighting physically, uh, aggressing each other, um, you know, just the whole surrounding of the building where the meeting was happening was uh, just all covered in blood and pictures depicting blood of whales and a lot of representatives of the environmental organizations were there. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, for the lack of a better word, circus-like. Um, but yeah, so for me, it was uh, uh, very interesting to be there in person. And I do unfortunately think that this is not uh, in a way an exception. I, I do believe that in a lot of cases, um, international negotiations sometimes turn into uh, that kind of event because again, politics versus science is something that we've seen in the recent several years with the, for example, the pandemic or some other issues. Uh, we see that uh, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, politics wins over scientific and uh, evidence-based policies. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, and in terms of challenges, 
Um, yeah, uh, I would say that uh, definitely just uh, work on your personal demons, maybe, if I may. Uh, so just uh, kind of overcoming your own, oh, I don't know anything. And these people that I'm talking to have been in this area of work for 20 years. What can I say? Will I be able to produce something that's new and worthwhile? Um, was something that I struggled with in the beginning of my research um, project. Um, also, definitely gaining trust in terms of people just seeing, oh, you're a young woman, um, not Japanese. Will you actually be able to understand and portray what we want to say in the right way, as I mentioned, so gaining trust. And also, I would say that on the um, part of the analysis of the data I collected, uh, that was also a bit of a struggle that I didn't anticipate in the beginning of the project, because at first I was just very eager to talk to as many people as possible and to get invited to all of the possible events and to go everywhere. But then you only have a certain amount of time. And then when it comes to analysis, I ended up with so, so, so much data. Um, that I would say planning for it in advance and um, leaving yourself with plenty of time to actually analyze it and look through it and identify themes and not leave anything that you have collected behind, um, I, I think is important and it's important to consider on uh, early stages of your research project. Um, just to name a few, I think uh, logistical challenges were also kind of important. So going to Brazil was a whole, a whole uh, different issue. And uh, again, as I said, um, International Women Commission um, sessions usually happen um, behind closed doors, so you have to be either representative of a country or representative of the media, which uh, neither applies to me. So, for example, getting there uh, also was a little bit of a challenge, um, but it was a, it was a good challenge. I loved actually doing that, and it was an adventure. So. I think it's a it's a great thing to challenge yourself while doing your PhD research. So I also see a question in the chat from um, uh, Shoya Sensei. So more about the position of anti whaling activists in Japan and the logic employed by them. So as I said, um, although I did uh, participate in one uh, event as opposed to many many events that were uh, mostly anti anti whaling. Um, so I participated in one event and interviewed uh, two people who uh, were very strongly opposed to Japan whaling. Um, so one strong theme there is that uh, what Japanese government portrayed as scientific whaling is not scientific. So it is, it, it is in their opinion, does not um, uh, qualify for scientific research. And, uh, you know, Japan could do perfectly without it. And it's just... Um, as just uh, uh, something that they use to, as a cover up to still be, um, you know, employing the whaling ships. And, um, you know, th with the fact that it has ended in the uh, few recent years, I would say that that argument actually ceased to be. Uh, so I guess in, in that way, uh, they have won the argument. And that was partially also supported by uh, certain representatives of the anti anti whaling uh, group in Japan. Uh, and also, I would say that um, the few people that I talked to, again, as I mentioned, one of the one of the women, um, she's a vegetarian. So again, positions of vegetarian people who don't believe in consuming animal protein in any shape or form um, is, to, in my mind, very understandable. And then it's very logical to me. So if you don't consume, um, if you don't consume animal protein, and of course, then. Uh, logically, you also don't uh, support um, consuming whale protein or whale products, then there's no issue, there's no question. So um, in her opinion, it was just cruel, but cruel in the context of just killing animals taken all together. So I would say these were the two strongest themes uh, and, uh, and, and probably most prominent. Again, very interesting stories. Very interesting how she she came to this uh, to this side of, of the spectrum uh, in Japan, and it's interesting to see uh, uh, this woman and her some of her colleagues to oppose what seems to be a predominant um, narrative within Japan. Uh, I imagine it's not psychologically very easy, um, but um, in terms of the argument, I would say yeah. So vegetarianism uh, and um, and uh, strong opposition to scientific whaling, which is deemed non-scientific, in fact. 
Thank you for answering all of these questions. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but before we let everybody go, maybe you can tell people where and when they can find your book. So this is still uh, a question I can't answer, but I will be happy to provide. This is still in the process of being reviewed. I still hope to make a tiny little bit of revisions um, to it, uh, but hopefully sometimes this year, hopefully in autumn. Uh, it will be published with Rootledge. Um, and um, again, the where question is in the same category. Uh, I will know a little bit more details in a few months or so, and we'll be happy to let you know. Also, um, in case people have uh, additional questions, I'll be happy to respond via email. If you are willing to share my email, uh, I'm always uh, I'm always happy to engage in conversation on this. It's one of my favorite topics. so. Uh, very welcome your questions after this uh, seminar as well. Thank you very much. So yes, in case you have more questions to ask Dr. Shutova, you can get in touch with me following the information on the poster and I can get you in touch with um, Nadia. So thank you very much, Nadia, for joining us today and uh, sharing uh, wonderful findings and your experience conducting this research. Uh, we will reconvene uh, on June 20th uh, with uh, Ms. Uh, Ubaidulayeva's lecture. Uh, thank you for joining us today.